Brain connectivity, brain health, brain disorders, and brain research are on the top of his passion list. Actually, Dr. Max Sinatter is curious about everything to do with the human brain. He is a lauded scientist, a UBC professor, a member of the Order of Canada and Order of BC. He's director of the Brain Research Center and the Center for Brain Health. When Dr. Sinatter looks at a map, it is more likely to be a map of the brain, the human brain, rather than a map that guides you to Kelowna. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Max Sinatter to the Shaw Studio once again. Well, thank you very much for having me, Fanny. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, thanks for driving all the way here. Uh, brain intact. So far, so good. Okay. So, will we ever really understand the relationship between the mind and the brain? Oh, man, you're starting with a tough one, aren't you? Of course. <laughs> you know, it's a fantastic problem that's been around for well, literally thousands of years. People have wondered about it. I think, realistically, we are still a long way for, from really understanding uh, the relationship between mind and brain, whether mind is anything more than a product of brain, what consciousness is, uh, and all of these great questions. I think if you know there's still a Fanny Kiefer show a hundred years from now, you might have some uh, you know eager young scientists like myself coming on the show and telling you, you know, we're making a lot of progress in understanding the relationship between mind, brain, and consciousness. And you know, we actually are. It's a you know, it's a tough problem, and it sounds sort of metaphysical. And you might think, well, you can't really say much about it. But we are actually st starting to see the vaguest of outlines of what the solution might look like. So let me just give you like an example. Um, you might ask, um, like, where do thoughts come from? Uh -huh. So we can actually we can actually start to do real science on a question as profound and as simple as that. I was walking into a uh, room in our uh, brain research center a couple of months ago, and I was absolutely shocked. I opened the door. I thought the room was unused, and I was, you know, someone needed space. So I opened the door of the room, and there's a Buddhist monk in these flowing robes. Surprise. Uh, surprise. I'm surprised. He's surprised. We're all surprised. And he's actually... Um, participating in an experiment that is being run by a lady named Kalina Kristof, who's one of the, frankly, many brilliant researchers in our center. The great thing about Buddhist monks is you and I, um, uh, basically our thoughts just pour out all the time, one after another. We can't really control them. These Buddhist monks, they have learned over the years to empty their minds. They can have one thought every 30 seconds, and the rest of the time, it's just quiet in there. So here's what they do. They take one of these guys who's a well-trained meditator, and they put him in the scanner, and they say, OK, whenever you feel a thought coming on, and it doesn't happen that often, push this button. So they push the button. OK? And then what they do is they look back in the scanner and say, what was going on in all the different parts of the brain for the 5, 10, 15 seconds before he pushed that button? before that thought appeared. And they say, where's the activity? And they find it. So they interesting. actually found like a particular part of the brain. It's called the hippocampus that turns on. It's connected to your memories. And that's the part of the brain that thoughts seem to originate from. And then you can watch the thought spread through the other brain areas. If you looked at my brain, my monkey brain, my busy brain, yeah, you see. even at four in the morning, yeah. how would that look different than the brain of the meditating monk? The brain of the meditating monk uh, uh, would have uh, different uh, frequency characteristics. Mm -hmm. The waves would look different. Even the connectivity might be different. So one of the things we can now do is to, you know, you were talking about a map of the brain before. We can now image the brain in ways that were just impossible to think of a few years ago. We can see the structure, we can see the chemistry, and we can see what's connected to what. And we can watch what's connected to what change as you think about different things. So when you're practicing your violin, mm -hmm. you get one set of functional wires connected together, one 
assembly of neurons talking to each other. And then, as you say, okay, I'm finished my violin uh, practice now, now I'm cooking, a different set. And we can see that in these Buddhist monks. We can see uh, what's called, there's, there's even a set of uh, connections that appear when you're thinking about nothing. Like Seinfeld. Uh, well, like Seinfeld, like that Buddhist Or monk. that was the show about nothing. Well, that's right. That's the show about mm -hmm. nothing. But when you're thinking about nothing, there's actually a pattern of activity that is evoked. And it's actually very, very interesting, very significant. And would you believe, here's the bizarro thing. When you look at the parts of the brain that are damaged in Alzheimer's disease, mm -hmm. they, are, they exactly overlay onto that network that is called the default network, the network that thinks about nothing. Many of us aging boomers have a fear of dementia, obviously, of Alzheimer's, of uh, brain dysfunction. Is there a way to prevent it at some level, early in life, midlife, things we can do for the aging brain? Yeah, I think there are, there are actually quite a few things that uh, you can do, but they're, they're all the things your mother told you to do already. Don't smoke. Right. Uh, uh, watch your weight. Watch your blood pressure. Uh, you know, uh, keep your cardiovascular system in tip-top shape. And, uh, of course, you know, stay socially, emotionally, cognitively engaged. And here's something that is maybe not quite so obvious. Do exercise. Physical. Do physical exercise. exercise. In fact, I would say if you look at what people aren't doing, they're not, I think most people are not doing enough exercise. And when you ask further what kind of exercise, make sure that you not only do cardio, but you also do weight bearing exercise. And that affects your brain. That affects your brain. So, so an Arnold Schwarzenegger, pumps a iron, young Arnie, yeah. who pumped iron, and goes on to be governor of California. See how well he did. See how well he did. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's an amazing thing. Uh, one of our scientists, Teresa Lou Ambrose, did a study with a group of women in Dunbar, and she, you know, um, 65 to 75 year old women, she took one bunch and she said, stretch, and then she watched their cognitive performance after a year of stretching, took another bunch, uh, gave them cardio, watched their cognitive performance after a year, took another group, gave them weights. And what she found was that the stretching group did the worst after a year, mm -hmm. uh, the cardio group did much better, and then the weights did even better. Really, so lightweights, heavyweights, what about Pilates, something like that, yeah, something gyrotonics, like that. Yeah. something that stretches you, that you have to yeah. use yeah, uh, exactly. force against force, that type of thing. What I, you know, what I tell people is, uh, what you should do is you should have a book club, but you should conduct it while you're hiking. <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, 